Rome, 98 CE. Roman historian Tacitus takes a sip of wine as he pours over scrolls. He's compiling an ethnographic study of the German tribes, including their drinking customs. To pass an entire day and night in drinking disgraces no one, he says to the scribe he's dictating to. Their quarrels, as it might be expected with intoxicated people, are seldom fought with mere abuse, but commonly with wounds and bloodshed. Yet it is at their feasts that they consult on the reconciliation of enemies, matrimonial alliances, choosing chiefs, and even on peace and war. For they think at no time is the mind more open to simplicity of purpose, or more warmed to noble aspirations. After a digression, he describes their particular alcohol. A liquor for drinking is made out of barley or other grains, which once rotted has a certain resemblance to wine. Ugh, revolting barbarians, he thinks, as he takes another sip of his fermented grapes. Thanks so much to HelloFresh for helping us bring this history to the table. Beer was the drink of the Fertile Crescent, of Egypt and North Africa. Indeed, the beverage ruled the ancient world, until it was conquered by the same enemy that menaced all of Europe, the Romans. The Romans were a wine culture a drink they considered synonymous with civilization, made from a crop that did well in the Italian environment. From the palaces to the far provinces, to be an ancient Roman was to drink wine, and they exported it everywhere in their burgeoning empire. All other alcohols they labeled as foreign, perhaps the worst slur in Roman culture. The irony, of course, being that wine was imported to Rome from Greece, and they learned much of the cultivation from it from Carthage. Heck, even their sneering dismissal of other drinks was, like practically all their gods, inherited from the Greeks. But as the Roman Empire pushed north into Europe, it increasingly contacted other drinking traditions, ones based around what can broadly be called beer. Now, all of the information we have on drinking in northern and central Europe at this period comes from Roman sources and archaeological evidence, so there's a lot of gaps. But Roman writers do note that even at the time of the Gallic Wars, the people of central and northern Europe were barrel-making cultures who enjoyed a wide variety of drinks. These included ale, ale mixed with honey, types of local wine, and mead, which is made from fermented honey rather than grain. But most importantly, they make it very clear that to the Romans, all types of ale were absolutely gross. Beer was generally made from barley, a grain they mostly fed to horses, i.e. literal animal feed. In Rome, barley is what you ate during famine, and they even punished military units by making them live on barley. So when they saw people creating a barley mash, letting it rot in a wooden barrel, and then drinking it, blah, that was a double yuck. Though just FYI, this rotting was the same process of fermentation that produced their precious wine, so glass houses and all that. Some tribes, like the Gauls, who inhabited what is now France, took to Roman wine and even began cultivating it themselves, while others were more resistant. In his Gallic War, Caesar wrote that the toughest and wildest tribes were the Germans, and in particular the Belgians, who both refused Rome's drink. They do not at all allow wine to be imported among them, he wrote, since they believe that by it men are made soft and effeminate for the endurance of hardship. And Caesar agreed, believing that wine drinking had weakened the Gauls and assisted Rome's civilized conquest. Now, Caesar never mentioned beer at all, but later Roman authors expanded on this idea of beer making barbarians wild and strong with the comforts of civilization, particularly wine, enfeebling them. At the same time, the rulers of the tribes who came under the Roman banner started drinking wine, making it associated with higher status, and do you detect a stereotype forming here? Wine, the drink of the civilized and powerful, of educated city dwellers, one that tames wild men but makes them effeminate and weak, and beer, a common man's brew that makes drinkers strong and wild, courageous and quarrel-prone, that imparts the raw toughness civilization lacks. And like it or not, those ideas are still with us today. It should be noted, however, that Roman troops did gradually start drinking beer, especially in the far-flung posts like Britain, when wine wasn't available. And that's kind of how things stood, with wine as the dominant drink, until the Western Roman Empire fell and the transport networks for wine crumbled. So what are people drinking after Rome's collapse, you ask? Well, in places like Normandy and Bordeaux that produced wine grapes, still wine. But outside those areas, mead was now the most important beverage of the elite, particularly in Germany, Scandinavia, and Britain. There, mead halls were an important part of culture, a communal spot for socializing, swearing oaths, and conducting business. Now we could spend an entire episode on mead halls and their social political functions, but right now I want you to look at its architecture, with its large open spaces, benches, and long tables. What does that look like to you? Yep, it's a beer hall, the kind largely associated today with Germany, and if you're in my neck of the woods, Astoria. What up, Bohemian Hall? 
Sorry, back on track. Though spurned by the powerful, ale had never gone fully out of fashion with average households. It was too useful and easy to make, and therefore the preferred everyday beverage. In Germany, it held on tenaciously, and in Ireland, which the Romans decided not to mess with, beer was never interrupted at all. Now, the idea that medieval people drank beer due to water being unsafe is mostly a myth. The Middle Ages not being ancient Sumer, after all, and fresh supplies of clean water were abundant even in cities. But ale was considered more pleasurable, hearty, and hospitable. A young monk spoke for most Europeans when he observed that he drank, quote, ale if I can get it, and water if I have no ale, unquote. By the year 1000, ale was also starting to become commercial. Monks brewed it for the poor or sold it to sustain the monastery. Ale was also considered a type of liquid bread, meaning it could be drunk for sustenance during fast days when the monks were only supposed to consume bread and water. However, women still did the vast majority of brewing. They brewed for the household and sold or exchanged whatever they had left over. Sometimes, neighbors took turns in a goods exchange, with one neighbor brewing one week and the other the next. Inevitably, some women were better at it than others and began to open the front rooms of their homes as businesses. When the beer was ready, this alewife would put an ale wand, a sprig of branch, outside to signal that they were open for business. Then neighbors would come to either fill their buckets to take back home or bring cups to consume beer on the premises. These homes, dubbed alehouses in England, were the first type of public house, and soon they were joined by taverns, which also sold wine and offered private rooms for the wealthy, and inns that offered food, overnight accommodation, stables, and often financially incentivized company in the rooms upstairs. The ale they served was porridge-like, full of spice and berry flavorings, and mostly the low-alcohol small beer. People drank 10 liters of it a day. By the reign of Henry III in the 13th century, the trade was big enough to attract regulation. As part of a law called the Assize of Bread and Ale, the first food and drink quality legislation in Britain, local officials called ale tasters would tour establishments every six weeks, doing the very hard demanding work of ensuring the ale being sold was of sufficient quality, fairly priced, and had its strength labeled. Ooh, that sounds like a tough job, Zoe, but someone had to do it. You know, preferably someone who gave their brother-in-law the mayor a nice fat purse right before their appointment. Ah, delicious, delicious corruption. But on the continent, a new innovation would change beer forever. Because in Germany, people were adding hops to ale in order to give it a more complex, bitter, smoky flavor and also preserve it. This also, by some definitions, turned ale into true beer. Now, sometimes it's been said that the polymath abbess Hildegard von Bingen was the first to hop ale, creating what we now know as beer. And while it's possible she did some experiments with that, you know, between running a convent, writing poetry and plays, receiving visions from God, practicing medicine, drafting works of philosophy and science, creating her own language, and being the most prolific musical composer of the Middle Ages, people had been experimenting with hops for centuries before her birth. So, you know, maybe we can't chalk this one up to her. And hops changed everything. Taste-wise, sure, but also when it came to production. Hopped beer lasted weeks, meaning for the first time, beer could be made in large quantities and exported as commercial product, importantly, far across the sea. So grab a barrel and roll with us next week as we form guilds, swig with Martin Luther, and ask the pressing question, is getting drunk a sin? And while you ponder that thirst-quenching question, perhaps you'd enjoy a home-cooked meal to go with your possibly sinful beverage? Right on time, HelloFresh. But what's HelloFresh, you ask? Why, it's a tasty meal kit delivery service that can save you a bunch of time and keep your belly super happy, all while eliminating tedious trips to the grocery store and stressful meal planning. You get everything you need to prepare delicious meals, all delivered to your door, and you can be eating in a half hour or less. Ooh, and this week, I was really burning to cook their firecracker meatballs. And while I don't want to sound like a certain celebrity chef, the words flavor explosion did come to mind. And now that Zoe and I have had keys made to Jeff's house, don't worry about it, we got to join in his family-sized chicken sausage spaghetti bolognese. What? We'll do the dishes. <coughs> Delectableness and non-digits aside, another thing HelloFresh gets right is their continued work on the sustainability front. Ingredients are pre-portioned, which means less food waste, and the carbon footprint of their service is actually 25% smaller than meals made from store-bought groceries. And now's a great time to try HelloFresh for yourself with this dynamite deal. All you gotta do is go to HelloFresh.com and use the code EXTRACREDIT16 for up to 16 free meals and 3 surprise gifts, including free shipping. Now, I'll just say that again in case your stomach was growling too loud. You can get free food while supporting the content you love, the environment, and not to mention, your grumbly tummy. Again, that's 16 free meals at HelloFresh.com using the code EXTRACREDIT16. Your time and taste buds will thank you, and so will we. Thanks. 
the biggest EC thanks to Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Angela Valenciana, Casey Muscha, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kyle Murgatroyd, and Orioles1 for being fantastic legendary patrons.